Hey everyone. So by that point, you already heard a lot probably about double hashing. So what I want to tell you about is how we added um, double hashing to IPNI. So also, um, I'm a software engineer in Bedrock team in the IPNI part of it, and we're not just um, uh, like maintaining a specification, we're also running a service that Massey told about, which is called seed.contact, which has, uh, I, I don't know, like trillion CADs uh, indexed by that point, a bit more, and we needed to all, also migrate this whole data set to double hashing at scale without causing any service disruption to the, to the users. So I, I will touch a bit on the specification, how it's compatible with the DHE, and then uh, talk a bit about the, uh, how we dealt with it in seed.contact. So uh, just to recap uh, how data gets into IPNI, so that happens in four simple steps. So step number one is uh, storage providers, when they uh, have some new data, they announce it onto uh, lib P2P pub sub topic. So uh, IPNI is listening to this uh, lib P2P by pub sub, and when it sees a new uh, advertisement uh, of content being available, it would reach out to the to that storage provider directly and fetch the, uh, the new advertisements. So that's essentially the right path. Then on the lookup path, when a user wants to find something, they would provide uh, the send a request to IPNI with a seed or multi-hash. IPNI would return uh, a bunch of uh, providers where the data can be fetched from, and then the user would go and fetch the cat picture from the provider of their choice. So that's essentially uh, uh, the flow. Uh, so IPNI is used to, is across both um, IPFS and uh, Filecoin networks. Um, yeah, and has been default uh, content router uh, alongside DHT since Kuba version uh, 18, as far as I remember. So also about the uh, uh, privacy. So we kind of separate two main topics here. So there is a reader privacy and uh, writer privacy. So uh, this specific uh, presentation is focused on the reader privacy. So reader privacy, this means that as a user, I don't want neither IPNI like or other content router or some man in the middle who's observing the traffic to be able to figure out what data I'm looking for or where this, yeah, and where that data can be can be fetched from. So on the other hand, the uh, writer privacy, this means as a content publisher, I don't want the content routing system to be able to spy on me. So both of the topics are equally important and we will address uh, uh, both of them eventually. But right now, so our uh, primary focus is the reader privacy and that's what the, this presentation is focused on. Uh, so let's see what the IPNI results uh, uh, look like. So uh, you can, just check it in your browser if you want, but I, I can go through it through it here. So at the top, you've got a multi-hash. So multi-hash is an inner, comp inner component of the CID. So that's the digest over the data. So here it's uh, base uh, 58 formatted. So, and then we send a lookup and the PNI returns you zero or many provider results. So, and provider results has a, has a few fields. So uh, uh, let's start from the, from the bottom. So at the bottom, there is a uh, provider info. So it consists of the lib P2P identity of the provider and the addresses where the data can be fetched from. So uh, the next one is the metadata. So metadata defines protocols uh, that the data can be fetched over. It can be like BitSwap, Filecoin, GraphSync, HTTP, and et cetera. In the future, there is no special format uh, uh, into it. It's just a binary field. And uh, the last one is the context ID. Context ID is the internal provider specific field. So it's not very interesting in the context of that presentation, but that's something that providers can, can use uh, as an identifier internally. So if to simplify IPNI, basically you can, we can imagine that this is just like two uh, endpoints. So one endpoint is get, uh, and get uh, you send multi hash and returns you a list of peer IDs, and put you put multi hash and it, with a, with a list of peer IDs assigned to it, like a big uh, uh, hash map. Um, so but with the real privacy implemented, we don't want neither API nor a passive observer like spying over the traffic to be able to understand what we are looking for. So uh, before uh, uh, like going forward, just wanted to. 
uh, explain a bit of the notation that is going to be used going forwards. So hash over data means uh, obviously hash over data. Uh, ANC means encryption, that the data is encrypted with a key. Derived key means the key, cryptographic key derived from the data. Nonce is a cryptographic nonce. Uh, MH stands for multi hash. Uh, double uh, vertical line stands for double pipe stands for concatenation. So uh, cat concatenated dog equals cat dog. Then peer ID is lib P2P identity of the provider. Um, oh, multi hash is twice. Okay. So in context ID is uh, this provider specific identifier that uh, it's not really interested in interesting in the context of that presentation. Metadata is API metadata. So let's see like for our cat picture, what we can do. So uh, uh, first of all, like as, as a step one, so you kind of, uh, in order for data to be discoverable, you need to put it on pin on some IPFS node, as well as you need to make the routing system aware that that content is located at that node. So you would uh, get a CAD of that content first, get a multi-hash of it. So then you would do two things, you would calculate uh, a hash over multi-hash, and that's where the name double hashing is comes from. Uh, uh, as was explained before, so because multi-hash is already a hash over the content. And at the same time, you would derive key from that multi-hash cryptographic key, and then uh, you would take the uh, identity of the provider that has that content, and you would encrypt the identity with the key derived from the original multi-hash. So then you would take the pair of the of the hashed multi-hash and the encrypted payload and put it into IPNI and you would put the cat picture onto IPFS node. So this is uh, like uh, pretty simple. So uh, also IPNI has some extra data associated with the uh, provider record, not just identity of the provider. So let's see how it's, how the full flow works on the IPNI side. Um, there are uh, like a few steps there. So essentially, like the, uh, the main punchline is that we want API to be really fast. We want it to be like just a single lookup request. And after that lookup request, you can get the results and start reaching out to the providers. So, and even with uh, uh, writer privacy, imp uh, reader privacy imp uh, implemented, we want that to be continued to be true. So basically, uh, uh, when, when a user wants to look up something, they would calculate a hash, they would send the hash to API. So IPNI would do like a quick index lookup and find the disencrypted records that have been put into it, fetch them, send them, send them back to user. So at that point, user can decrypt them using the original multi-hash value and can start reaching out to the, to the providers. So they can use, for example, lib P2P, um, uh, what's the stream, uh, multi stream select and basically reach out, negotiate um, uh, protocol. So additionally, so as we mentioned in one of the previous slides, IPNI has some metadata. And metadata, uh, but we also don't store it in open in IPNI. We also encrypt them, encrypt it, in, we encrypt it in exactly the same way as we do it with the, uh, with the provider identities. So now instead of deriving key from multi-hash, we derive key from the provider identity, concatenated with the context ID, and encrypt metadata with it. So if user wants to, uh, uh, basically uh, fetch metadata, they can, can do that and they would do like another round trip to IPNI and would fetch that metadata and but by doing that like uh, a few times they would assemble the full uh, resulting IPNI payload. So having said all of that, so the whole, uh, we can see what essentially are the indexes that are stored in IPNI. There's just like a two indexes. One is like hash of the multi-hash uh, mapped to uh, nonce can concatenate it with the encrypted peer IDs. And second one is hash over the uh, peer ID concatenated with context ID, mapped to nonce uh, with, uh, and uh, concatenated with encrypted metadata. So this is essentially the two indexes that, uh, that we store. Uh, we use exactly the same functions across both DHT uh, and API, the same for encryption, same magic values, same, um, same hashing. So these are the functions that we use, like uh, SHA-256 for hashing, ASGCM with 12 byte node nonce for encryption. So uh, with the multi-hashes, when we double hash them, uh, we always make sure that it has the correct codec. That's what tells uh, the indexer that this is a double hash and double hash can be treated differently. And uh, as I mentioned, DHT and API have like fully compatible formats. So in fact, if you look into DHT and API record, so DHT has some 
more data in it, so I, I, I won't go like through what the fields mean, uh, but basically the uh, IPNI PNI's record is a subset of the, of the DHT. So basically we can uh, take the records, for example, from DHT, put them into IPNI, and that would, would just walk out of the box. So this is it about from the specification point of view. Are, are there any questions uh, at this point? <clears throat> okay, cool. So uh, now I want to talk about the uh, c.contact. Um, so c.contact, uh, I hope the data about the, how much stuff we ingest is accurate. So um, basically we ingest about like 5 billion multi-hashes per day, about 2,500 requests per second, 100% uptime. Uh, we use it for both uh, IPFS and Filecoin. So we do have some IPFS nodes advertising into um, IPNI and uh, basically Kuba uses uh, c.contact for, for lookups. And it's uh, default contact router since uh, Kubo, Kubo version 18. So uh, uh, again, and our goal when introducing IPNI was uh, to, uh, when introducing double hashing, was to not to cause any service disruption and continue serving users for both uh, uh, ha uh, double hashed and not double hashed uh, paths. So uh, this is how uh, simplified version of C.contact looks under the hood. So uh, if we start from the, from the right, these are the storage providers. Uh, then in the middle, uh, basically C.contact is based on the uh, IPNI, IPNI implementation called store the index. And we have like a few instances running. So we call them uh, with Viking names. Um, so there are three of them at the minute in production. So Kepa, Dido, and Odin. So each of these instances is uh, backed by the uh, key value data store. We use Pebble. So Pebble is the inner component of the commercial product called CockroachDB. So it's basically the key value store that's used there under the hood. So we have like running multiple uh, instances of of indexer for two purposes. It's basically, one is experimentation. So for example, if we want to introduce a new data store, we would set up a new instance and see how this data store performs um, or like tune parameters and etc. And we also do sharding. So we shard uh, by provider so we can uh, tell which indexer would be processing uh, which provider. So, and this is done by the assigner service. So basically assigner service when it sees a new announcement on the LibPTV pops up topic, it would pick it up, it would then would check, okay, is this a new provider? I already know about it. If I already know about it, that's fine. If it's new, it would just explicitly assign this provider to one of the indexes. So, and this is essentially the write path. On the read path, when the request comes in, it hits our proxy server, which is called indexer, and the sole responsibility of it to do is scatter gather request across all the instances. So index sub would just scatter the request, gather the results, compose them over and send it back. So all read requests um, are going through the index term. So basically when moving to double hashing, we want to take that opportunity to do, uh, uh, to re-architect stuff a bit with uh, uh, scalability in mind because we, we see like increased amount of the traffic coming to c.contact, we expect it to be even uh, more requests, more writes, so we want to make sure that we are, uh, we are scalable. So we've done a few changes, so they're highlighted with the red color. So uh, let me start with the uh, DH store. So we introduced the service called DH store. So essentially what it means, uh, DH store stands for double hash store. So essentially what uh, now store the index is not backed by a local database, but instead it writes into the remote service. And DH store is, uh, so simple, it just stores like it just stores uh, binary keys mapped to binary, binary values without knowing any context about it. So store the index now becomes it just uh, uh, becomes a service that traverses the chains and writes them and writes them into the remote store. We also unhooked store the index from the from the lookup path. So uh, the now the request from the index star, they won't be read requests, won't be rooted into store the index. So it's not in the on the read path anymore. So uh, also we introduced, uh, we hooked up DH store directly to index star. So uh, as I mentioned before, so when we uh, double hash the multi hash, we add the special codec to it. So when a, a double hash request hits index star, we know that it's been double hashed and then we can route it straight to the DH store and uh, 
uh, return results straight from it, which is going to be like instant. Um, and we also want to support uh, regular queries, and we introduced a new service, uh, dhfind. So a dhfind stands for obviously double hash find, and when um, a regular request comes in, dhfind would take it, would uh, would implement the whole like reader privacy workflow. It would go to dh store, it would fetch the uh, all the data, decrypt it, uh, assemble the payload, and return to the user. And in fact, if you hit dh find, so basically the result you see is exactly similar to what you would have seen if you hit the un not double hashed uh, not double hashed indexer. Um, so uh, if you get results from the from dh store. Uh, directly, so now instead of like seeing open results, like playing payload, you would see something like that. Uh, so basically, you would see a multi hash, and then you would see a number of binary blobs. And uh, uh, there is specification how you decrypt them and convert them into provide identities. Um, what eventually we want to do? We want to get rid of the uh, un uh, not double hash uh, path completely, so we want all the requests to, to be previously preserving, but that would take, uh, that would take some time. That's why uh, at the minute we are going to be supporting uh, this service DH find. Uh, it's super simple, it's essentially uh, just a wrapper around uh, uh, a client, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it scales really well, so if we see more demand for regular queries, we would scale it up, if not scale it down until we retire it completely. We also, with the um, write a privacy upgrade, we want to remove the, right now, store the index, it does encryption on behalf of the client because advertisement chains, they can still contain the raw, uh, uh, raw data, but we don't want to be the case, like in the future. Basically, once we uh, introduce the protocol upgrade for the, for the write, writes, we would also remove the encryption on behalf of the client. Um, yeah, and that's basically it. So, and uh, if we like look into the future, so like this, this is how simplified architecture uh, could look like. Uh, that uh, store the index traverses chains that uh, of advertisements that are encrypted. It writes them into DH store. DH store is super simple, and it, sh it can be sharded very well. So we can uh, scale it up to to the demand, and then index targets uh, would uh, scatter together across uh, multiple DH store instances. So, um, uh, like spoiler alert, so we are not, uh, have not migrated this in production yet. We still, uh, in, uh, our indexes are still catching up. So in the migration strategy, basically we've chosen, we've chosen to re-ingest everything from a scratch. So basically instead of migrating the existing data, we just uh, uh, redone, it, uh, redone it from a scratch. So uh, indexes uh, are currently running, uh, double hashed index is currently running in production. Uh, however, the results from it are not hooked up to the output of index star, but instead we use it to collect some metrics about double hashed coverage. So that would tell us like when actually we are ready to move to, to production. So, and we collect uh, a few metrics. So we do have like huge dashboards and uh, we, this is like uh, some of the double hashing specific metrics. Um, so our criteria is to be able, obviously for uh, DH find and DH store should be able to provide like similar coverage, similar or better coverage, uh, latencies uh, that we are currently getting from the unhashed seed dot contact. So we measure like a few things. So first thing is provider coverage. The so provider coverage tells how many providers that are known by our double hashed indexer uh, versus how many providers are known by c.contact. Like for example, c.contact knows about like 600-ish active providers, I think. So in basically we are almost uh, uh, double hashed index and knows like 99% of them. So the th second thing is uh, uh, called distance. So distance set tells. So how many advertisements need to be ingested by double hashed indexer in order to catch up with the regular indexer. So and, and at the moment this kind of number fluctuates and uh, at the moment it's like a, a million. Uh, but that's, it kind of fluctuates and it should be like lower than a million, maybe like a few hundred thousand ideally. Um, then um, the read coverage. So this one is uh, the, the, the most, I think the most important one. So what we do, so we have this service called DH find running and we are not, uh, it's not hooked up to the, uh, it's hooked up to production traffic, but it's, it doesn't return any results. 
uh, instead of returning like uh, uh, real payloads, it immediately returns 404. But under the hood, in the background, it still performs the lookup and reports metric about it. So it doesn't affect any kind of like latency, it doesn't affect the results returned to the user, but we can collect data about how many find requests can be satisfied by hashed and encrypted data. So, and obviously that needs to be like as close to 100% as possible. Uh, so as index is still catching up, so this number also like fluctuates a bit, but I captured that screenshot um, today and it was like 32% uh, of the lookup request can be satisfied by double hashed indexer. Uh, we kind of uh, expect it to catch up. I don't know, I don't want to be overly optimistic, but like very, very soon within like a uh, few weeks maybe. Um, and the final one is obviously not not, uh, not found requests. It's, this is the, the uh, amount of requests that we cannot find in the double hashed index. Um, we've had quite a few bumps on the road while uh, introducing that so, or double hashing to c.contact. Some of them were uh, a bit embarrassing, uh, but still. So we've done like a few um, improvements. Um, so first of all, we use Pebble a lot, and Pebble is uh, underlying key value storage for CockroachDB. So CockroachDB is a commercial product. It comes with a bunch of stuff available out of the box, a bunch of metrics, guidances, and etc. But for Pebble, it's not the case. So we had to instrument it, and uh, when we uh, ingest the data, uh, we kind of uh, we sometimes see like horrible latencies. Some writes could take I don't know, randomly like tens of seconds to complete. Uh, we we are not sure what's going on, so we instrumented a database, started collecting a bunch of database-specific metrics such as like uh, read amplification and a bunch of others, and uh, uh, we tuned it up. And uh, now it performs uh, really well for our workload. Um, um, so this is one of the improvements we've done. So we introduced the S3 mirroring. And this is something my colleague Andrew is going to be talking about today. So um, the, uh, the, the punchline is the, one of the embarrassing bugs that we, we've hit. Instead of calculating two hashes, we've been calculating three hashes and over the multi-hash. And uh, when we discovered that, obviously, there is no way back. There is no way to unhash the stuff that we already uh, done and the most kind of like the thing that takes the, the most time is to actually fetch the advertisement chains from the providers. So we introduced uh, like S3 mirroring. This means that advertisements now can be stored on S3 and instead of like reaching out to remote storage provider, you would just go and fetch it from the um, S3 like storage bucket. So and that's significantly improved the uh, speed that we can like bootstrap a new indexer. A um, thing that Marcy talked about is a very important update, the anti-JSON. So um, with uh, double hashing um, uh, in API, you might require to do like a multiple round trips in order to assemble the full payload. And for example, some, uh, some multi-hashes which are specifically hot, they can, they can have like hundreds of records associated with them. And uh, like decrypting each record and then doing a round trip for fetching metadata for each record might take like a long time. That's why like anti JSON specifically for uh, is a must have for uh, reader privacy. So now instead of like waiting for all for, for decrypting all the records, we can just decrypt them uh, as they uh, come in, and basically uh, that significantly reduces time to first byte for the for the users. And uh, uh, yeah, so we've done like a number of other. Uh, optimizations to like the whole store the index implementation like we've I don't know uh, download speed improved like from 2 to 20 X um, right throughout put includes uh, improved around like 5 X and uh, yeah we've done like a lot of um, things to the latest versions of store the index um, also like I want to like quickly mention what kind of like uh, configuration we're running on um, so these two services we, that we introduced, um, we like DH store, just we're running at the minute just a single instance of it. So it's a memory optimized instance in AWS, 60 gigs RAM, six v vCPUs. Uh, we like at the minute 10 terabytes GP3 volume is, uh, is enough for us. And we found a sweet spot with uh, GP3 volume configuration. So that allows us to like ingest the amounts of data that needs to be ingested. So and for DH finds, it's like super, it's super lightweight. At the moment, we're running five of them, which seems to be enough, but kind of we can scale it up or down. So and they're super tiny, just one uh, gigabyte from and uh, one and a half uh, vCPUs. So but again, we can scale them up uh, and uh, uh, scale them down. So and obviously, but just want to reiterate, we are not in the end of our journey yet. So 
the current radiation speeds looks promising, but we still have not, have not still um, fully connected it to production. But we kind of like roughly there, um, not to be super optimistic. And uh, yeah, um, basically all services, all the, not just store the Unix, but the, the whole thing is uh, open source. And we also open source not just the services themselves, but also all the Terraform configurations, all the all customization and etc. that we use to bootstrap uh, seed.contact. So if someone can just bootstrap like mirror from it by just running our Terraform and applying the customization and just, uh, yeah, it's, it's very doable. So if you want to uh, get in touch, it's IPNI Slack channel and or IPNI GitHub. Yeah, I think uh, that's it. So any, any questions? Uh, yeah, so why are you using Pebble instead of a real database, like, I know, like some kind of foundation DB or, you know, whatever is like a big, big data store? Uh, so it's a great question. It's not our first kind of iteration. It's like, I think it's a third or fourth database that we tried with. And uh, it, uh, Pebble is like super simple and also it offers... Um, uh, um, it has a merge function. Basically, it doesn't uh, flush to the disk for uh, every write, as far as I remember. You can specify the kind of like a merge technique. So when you perform, so the, it has very, very good write throughput. So we've done um, some testing against other data stores that we use, and Pebble performed like on magnitude better than, than others. And um, yeah, I think uh, it was Massey who discovered it first, and uh, specifically because it's used as a key value storage for uh, CockroachDB, and uh, we've done some tests in it, the results were, were really good. Just a quick thing to add. Uh, the, the storage in uh, IPNI just uses vanilla key value store. Uh, we don't need any SQL engine, nothing like that, right? No matter how fast a real database implementation is, the, the overhead of a SQL engine is non-zero, right? Yeah, so that is why you mentioned Foundation DB specifically, uh, because it's a cave value store, uh, just distributed. So it's also very fast. There's like others like TKV. Uh, so yeah, it's just things to try, I guess. Cool, thank you. Great question. So yeah, so th th that's the one we tried and we're really happy with performance. Maybe we can find a better one in the future. Yeah, totally open to trying that. Thank you. This is a more forward looking question, but how do we think about like de debugability in the future? So like we might write bugs. How do we know if we've made a mistake? Uh, if everything's encrypted and we can't see the providers or the or know what SIDs are being looked up if we get bug reports? Uh, hey, that's a great question. And uh, so it depends where the bug is. So the, the worst ones are in the bugs in crypto code. If you get the cryptography wrong or messed up the record format somewhere, I guess you would have to just rebuild the index because it's you cannot decrypt stuff because it's encrypted and you don't have the original key. So that's the worst kind of surface where you can, can could find a bug. If there is a bug in a in a service logic somewhere, then it's we can just can handle it as a as a normal normal bug. So the main point is to not to have the bugs in the crypto codes like we had like for example three hashes instead of two, and uh, as long as there are no bugs there, then uh, it, it should be like similar to the current debugging experience. Just a, relating to David's question, uh, would it make sense to have? Uh, endpoints or services in IPNI or in general, even across the DHT, that allow a user to explicitly submit the original CID or you know, the, the key that we can then decrypt information with so that we can do debugging. Because right? when we have a, an encrypted world, we have basically two, two sides of the system. One is just implementation bugs for that, you know, yep, it's, software industry, you write tests and whatever. The other category of uh, 
bugs are the interaction bugs that we won't have any visibility into because the information is encrypted. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if it would make sense to have a sort of endpoint, a sort of well-known protocol by which we can go and submit a CID, which then reverses us back to the current state, which is I can use the CID, look up the information, see what you're getting, and then debug the system as if I am sitting, you know, and you're coming to. I was curious, what's your take on the What do you think? Yeah, it, it will make total sense. In fact, it's like what Dish Find does, right? So you kind of submit thing and open, it returns you like a, a payload. Also, we do have um, a client. So if if anyone ever used store the index, store the index has like a client that they can take and then you create it, you give it CD, it returns you provider records. We do have exactly the same one with the same API, but that just uh, does the implements the double hashing workflow. So, but we can use uh, that for for debugging too. So if you use give it open CID and see where things um, get broken if hopefully they don't. I wanted to ask real quick, for other index providers or operators who are operating their own index instances, do we have any thoughts on how we help them to achieve uh, having a reader privacy on their instances? Oh, that, that's a great question. So. Um, the way we approached migration, as I mentioned, we decided to re-ingest everything from scratch. There were like a few few reasons for that. So uh, uh, we, we switched to a new GP3 volume. So we wanted to find uh, a sweet spot, like basically uh, what kind of, how many IOPS, uh, how many throughput is going to be satisfactory for our workload. So we wanted, uh, we knew that uh, we can't um, implement migration, migration code for every possible type of storage. So and when others need to migrate to, uh, we want to provide like a simple path for them to do that. Um, uh, and uh, we also wanted to update the index counts. So uh, if you uh, look into the output of seed.contact, it uh, returns you like number of indexes for, for each of the providers. And uh, in order to, have the correct values basically you need to uh, we had to re-ingest the uh, uh, the whole thing because we started counting them like halfway through the, the life cycle and um, uh, uh, yeah so and uh, in order to speed up the whole ingestion process now we have like s3 mirror that again andrew is going to be talking about and uh, the punchline is that you can have like if you don't have to go to the remote providers then you can like rebuild index from s3 like much much faster so I, i'm not ready to say like how exactly how long it's going to take but maybe like five ten uh ten times faster depending where you're hosting hosting your services so for others uh, so maybe uh, i don't know this is something we can open to others to to use as well but andrew is going to be talking about that later on today cool awesome thank you very much